Hey guys, thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the Power to Pivot podcast. I am here today with author Christian Espinosa. Christian's the author of The Smartest Person in the Room, The Root Cause and New Solution for Cybersecurity. Christian, how are you today? I'm doing great, Elizabeth. How are you doing? I am doing so well. Thank you so much for asking. I There's so much to talk about. I'm so excited <laughs> that you're here. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. Let's start there. Uh, I'll kind of run through a, a quick quick down and dirty the background. So I grew up uh, very poor uh, with a, a drug addicted mother, prescription pain meds uh, on you know welfare and child support and uh, wick which is like government cheese and powdered milk uh, just very in a trailer just a very um kind of dysfunctional chaotic environment um i worked really hard to get out of that out of that environment i went to the air force academy uh i got a scholarship there uh because i you know i didn't have any money for college uh, and then i was in the military for about six years and did some department of defense uh contracting work for about 10 years uh, and all that, uh, my career in the military and the Department of Defense was was really focused on cybersecurity and information assurance. And then I started a commercial career, did freelance work, uh, where I did um, consulting, cybersecurity consulting and, and training. Uh, and then I started my company, Alpine Security, in 2014. And I sold my company, Alpine Security, uh, to Cerberus Sentinel in uh, December of 2020, so not too long ago. Uh, and then I, in the middle of that, I wrote a book uh, last year. Uh, I wrote the book and it, pub it was published this year in 2021. Uh, and that's kind of like everything in a nutshell. I, I do, I like extreme sports. I do a lot, of, I've done 22 Ironman triathlons and climbed to two of the seven summits, the highest mountains in the world. So um, anything with a lot of risk or a waiver where you could possibly lose your life or lose a limb uh, <laughs> is kind of intriguing to me, basically. So... That's, there's a lot, like I said, a lot, so much we could talk about. I, I want to, for those that are listening, want to dial back for a second because you're, you're like the cybersecurity guy. Now I hear danger, internet, and you know, my social security number and how does cyber, like, can you give us like a quick, like brief, what is cybersecurity? Cause it's probably way bigger than all of that. Yeah, cybersecurity is really about reducing the risk to an acceptable level for an organization that has data worth protecting. That could be your data. It could be their intellectual property. Uh, it could be a, a device, like a medical device that uh, they want to prevent someone from hacking into and killing somebody. Uh, it, you know, it could be a, a robotic system at a, a factory that manufactures cars. Mm -hmm. For instance, it's 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 reducing the risk of, uh, of something bad happening from a cyber criminal or some sort of a cyber threat, basically. In, in your experience, is that something that business owners undervalue as being an important component of their business? Most business owners do not think about it, unfortunately, until it's too late. And uh, one of my focuses uh, with my business is to help small and medium businesses with cybersecurity. Because what happens if there's a, a data breach and you have, uh, let's say 50,000 client records, you have a lot of clients and you have them in your um, database or something, if that's stolen, then the business that was compromised has to pay for credit monitoring for all those 50,000 people for multiple years. And that alone, that cost can bankrupt uh, many small businesses. So from an impact to our economy, uh, it, it's a big problem. And uh, I think awareness is, a, is something that a lot of small business owners need to be, or need to have. They need to have that awareness that, you know, it's not just somebody stealing your client data, it's the uh, monetary impact to your organization, which may cause your organization to cease to exist. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of scary. I think in your book, you make an interesting point though, that. The, the problem in cybersecurity has to do with people. <laughs> not, and not necessarily the way that sounds is, is it's, it's about asking better questions to get to better solutions for what the client actually needs. Am I correct there? Yes, it's about 
the, the solution is is with the people and the root cause is, is the personality types in the industry. We've got like really good technology. We have good processes. We've got a lot of things um, and we've been trying to make those things work for many, many years, but they're not working as uh, evidenced by the, you know, announcement of a new data breach every day. So it's, it's the people uh, from my experience, that's the root of the issue, the intellectual bullying, talking over people's heads, uh, poor communication, all those are contributing factors to why we're losing the cyber war. Mm -hmm. So the smartest person in the room, you know, to frame it back to the book is, is what? Explain to us who is the smartest person in the room in that case? The smartest person in the room is the high IQ and typically low EQ or people skills, uh, technical person in cybersecurity or technical person in a, in a technical industry. Uh, so those people that are the smartest person in the room, they get their significance by being intellectually smarter than other people. That's what makes them significant. So to maintain that significance, because we all want to feel significant, to maintain that, uh, that manifest uh, as intellectual bullying and posturing, which means uh, not admitting when you don't know something, and uh, talking over people's heads, basically, because that supports your identity of being the smartest person in the room. And those are the contributing factors to why we're losing the cyber war, because if you're trying to position yourself as the smartest person in the room and you're trying to, to, to talk to your users or your management or the board of directors about a cybersecurity problem and they're not understanding you, uh, then if they don't get it and they don't understand you, they're not going to be able to understand the real risk and the impact and how to fix the problem. And that, that, that's that been going on for years in, in our industry. We, we like to people like to talk over people's heads and then say, well, they just didn't get it, but it's our jobs to make sure they get it. How do you as the, the CEO and, and the leader in that company have that conversation with, you know, that person who wants to be the smartest person in the room to, to help them to dial that back? Because, and, and I'll be honest, I've sat in, in boardrooms, you know, as I'm listening to people have similar conversations that you just mentioned, where it's like, you're, you're not getting it. Like, this is not what the client's talking about. You're, you're up here and, and they're talking about, you know, something completely different. And there's that gap in communication, but somebody along the line doesn't want to, or can't take that step back to understand what the other person's saying. So how do you as the leader of the organization set the tone? With my organization, uh, there was a defining moment or, or moment that you know made me pivot basically, <laughs> uh, where I was getting, de this is probably in 2015 uh, or 2016, I was getting debriefed by one of my uh, engineers about how a penetration test uh, report review session went with a client. A penetration test is basically an ethical hacking um, engagement. And my engineer said that the client just didn't get it. And he was like, kind of like talking down uh, to the, you know, the fact that the client didn't get it. And I was in a different position because this is my business. I funded it, I founded it. And I thought, you know, I didn't start a business so my clients don't get it. You know, I started a business to make a difference and to make our clients more secure. So after that moment, uh, you know, and I thought back to the rest of my career and I, I realized that this is a pattern I've noticed in my entire career. And in fact, I was one of those people that used to talk over, you know, other people's heads and say they just didn't get it. I was part of the problem in the past. So after that moment, I really uh, took a step back and, 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 and figured out some training to do, uh, some neuro linguistic programming training, EQ training, awareness training, uh, communication training, and a lot of different coaching and training elements that I added to, um, you know, weekly sessions with my team to make sure that uh, our clients got it and our clients understood how to fix uh, the cybersecurity issues and how my team could work better together as well. Mm -hmm. How was that received? Like, it was was it met with like a open heart and an open mind? Was it, was there pushback? 
it, it wasn't, uh, I, I guess it, it was probably in the middle somewhere. It, it wasn't met like with open arms <laughs> uh, by, by no means. And it wasn't met completely closed either. Uh, I mean, my organization is relatively small. Uh, I think the most people we had at one point was 16. So it was a relative, relatively small organization. And I was the one uh, that led sort of the uh, transformation in the charge there. Um, but I, I, I tried to do my best to explain it in context of here is why this is important. And here, you know, here's the impact if we lose this customer or if this client we did something with didn't fix what we told them to fix because they didn't understand and they're breached and there's a li you know, we're liable for that. Here's the impact to your paycheck. You know, I tried to tie it all together and make it um, tangible as possible uh, and then relate that to here's why we need to do this EQ training. Here's why you need to understand, you know, where the client's coming from. Here's why we need to provide a, an awesome experience for the client, not just an awesome, you know, technical job. It's the entire experience that matters. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it was, um, it wasn't something I just flipped a switch and everybody like kind of like, you know, develop people's skills. <laughs> it was a, it was a long uh, journey with a lot of trial and error and a lot of um, reinforcement. Uh, and it, it's something you have to like uh, make part of your culture as well. Otherwise, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll clearly, it'll drift pretty quickly away from where you want it to. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that journey is ultimately what ended up being the seven steps uh, in the book of mine. Uh, this, the, what I call the secure methodology. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely comes back, I think, to leading by example, you know, particularly in, maybe not particularly in small businesses, I think it applies in all organizations. But, you know, when you are a small business and, you know, you have, you know, up to 20 people working for you, everyone's got eyes on you mm -hmm. every day. So, you know, for you to be able to implement and and be that example for people to see that it can make a change, to be able to also explain the whys and the how behind those decisions, I think are so important. Um, tell us the moment when you realized you had to write the book. Like, where were you when you're like, I have to put this in, in book form? I was at a, a Genius Network event in 2019 uh, is when I decided to write the book. Uh, a Genius Network, it's, a, it's like a mastermind uh, group for entrepreneurs. And at the event, it's like something clicked to me because most of the people I talked to had written a book. And I used to have this idea that uh, I'm not, you know, quote, an expert enough. I don't know enough. There's people that know more than me. Uh, so who am I to write a book? But something shifted at that uh, event, and that was like in October, November of 2019, uh, where I realized that everyone's on a journey. And if, if I'm further ahead on a journey than somebody else, and I can add value to them and help steer them away from uh, some of the dangers, then uh, why not, right? So I thought... Uh, and plus my voice is authentic and unique. So even though someone may have said something similar to what I've said, it may not resonate with, with certain people. So I thought, yeah, I'll go ahead and write this book because I have, you know, built a business. I've uh, implemented these things and I've made a lot of changes out of necessity uh, that I, and plus I think in my industry, you know, also something needs to change. We've been doing the status quo for so long and I, I, I'm not a fan of the status quo. So uh, I thought, you know, I need to, to write these lessons down and, and, and have an impact. Mm -hmm. I love it. The book is fantastic. Before we forget, where can we buy? So it's the smartest person in the room, the root cause and new solution for cybersecurity. Where can we find the book? Uh, Amazon.com is mm -hmm. the best place. Okay. And, um, what I think is interesting is you also talk about NLP, Neuro Linguistic Practitioner, um, the NLP methods, the suppositions, as a framework for how you as an individual can come in and learn this and then build this new communication around these suppositions. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit about what NLP is and how you implemented it? In your organization? Yes. NLP is neuro linguistic programming. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which basically means, uh, and, it, and it ties to my industry because I, I deal with a lot of technical people. So there's a lot of like, you know, computer programs. And so it's very interesting because neuro linguistic programming is a programming of your brain, basically. And we have these neural pathways uh, that are basically a program that runs in your brain when there's a trigger. So when something happens, we automatically start running this program and most of us are unaware of it. And the, the stimulus could be, it could be a phrase somebody says, it could be uh, a sirens you hear in the background, you know, whatever the input is, your brain automatically starts doing something. And before you know it, you've, auto, you've ran the whole program. This could be you know, exploding in a meeting because somebody said something that you didn't like or wh whatever. Uh, so, it's our job to have some awareness of those programs. A lot of those were formed when we were less than seven years old. Uh, it's our job to have some awareness of that and try to form new habits. So next time we hear a trigger, uh, we don't just start running that program again. We're aware enough of it to like hit a control C or to stop it uh, and to form a new program. Uh, because those pathways, the one that's been used the most is like a muscle you exercise, it gets stronger that's the one that's naturally going to happen. So to form a new neural pathway, it requires a lot of effort. Uh, and then the old one will eventually get weaker. Uh, so it's, it's reprogramming um, our brains basically. And some of the presuppositions, there's, there's 14 primary one, primary ones. Uh, the presuppositions are really from an awareness perspective, uh, gives you an idea of things to consider. Like, uh, you know, everybody has a different model of the world, for instance, that uh, communication, uh, the, meaning, the meaning of communication is a response you get. Uh, so that shifts, for instance, that, that's one of the NLP presuppositions, that shifts uh, your perspective on communication because a lot of people will just keep repeating the same thing, expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. But if the, if the meaning is shifted to you and ownership is on you, and you're not getting the response you want out of somebody else, then it's up to you to alter how you're communicating with that person, as an example. What I always love about NLP is it gives the person, the individual back so much of their power. Would you agree? A hundred percent, yes. Um, and I think, I think it's easy to forget about that. You know, we we walk around every day with with you know those set mindsets. We we run the programming. Um, mm -hmm. It's easy to give other people the power, and and that puts blame you know into the situation. Like it's not my fault; it's their fault. Or and I think there's a part in the book where you you bring up an example where, you know, one of your employees like you're having this conversation, and she says, "Well, it's their fault," you know, and. I think about that, like, how would you have, how do you apply NLP to that conversation to, to remind that person, like, you have accountability too? Because let's be honest, telling someone that they're personally responsible doesn't always get received in the best way. <laughs> People don't want to re be reminded in all situations that they, they have accountability. Um, mm -hmm. Walk us through it a little bit. One of the lessons I learned, uh, fairly early on in my business, I, I would hire people that uh, I had I had difficulty with uh, because they didn't have the same values I did. Uh, and I, I made that mistake a number of times. So, so I, I finally like stepped back and decided to establish core values for my business. Cause I used to think, you know, core values, like whatever, that's just stuff people put on a, you know, on the wall, <laughs> like a mission statement, it doesn't really matter. Right. But, but it, it, when I started thinking about it, to me, it mattered because the common thread I had with people I, that weren't a good fit for my business is they didn't match my core values. And one of them is ownership, like you just mentioned. Uh, so, so instead of like blaming everybody else or blaming, you know, the, the, the client or the prospect, or your teammate, you take ownership of the scenario. So I made ownership uh, one of my uh, core values. And then I had six. And then what I would do is anyone I hired, I would measure their performance, uh, not only on how well they did their job, but also how well they adhered to the core values. And then if somebody wasn't um, adhering to the core values, you know, they already, they already knew what they were and there was an agreement that they would follow them. So it wasn't like an attack on, on, on their personality. It's like, here's our core values. Uh, do you think you're following our core values in this scenario, for instance? Mm-hmm. 
how do you feel like you're asking people to have a growth mindset to be open-minded to allow for those possibilities to allow for a different way of of communicating doing business um finding solutions um it's not easy though right i i think it's important to acknowledge that like that to, to get someone it's like moving a mountain <laughs> in some cases yep. um tell us as a leader some of the challenges that you face because that it doesn't necessarily go well in those cases one of the challenges I, I faced is I used to believe uh, if people told me they wanted their amiable to change, they wanted to change, they, that they had a growth mindset, that they actually did. Uh, but the reality is not not everybody wants to embrace the growth mindset. Uh, some people want to, you know, cling on to their identity. Uh, which in, in some cases they don't want to shift their identity so that they're going to have more of a fixed mindset. And some people want to, you know, basically fight for the limitations. They want to say over and over and over, they're not good at this. They're not good at that. So those sort of people, as much as you want to shift them from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, uh, it's not going to work. It has to come from inside of them. Mm -hmm. So I used to try to help shift the people and it would be very frustrating for me because I would take ownership of it and I would think maybe, you know, I'm just not communicating this well enough. Maybe, uh, you know, I need to try a different tactic, you know, you know, maybe I'm not doing something right. And I'd find myself like extremely frustrated trying to convince people to go from fixed to growth. And what I realized is, you know, you can only do so much. It has to be the individual and some people, and it's like the matrix, the movie. Uh, and I make an analogy about that in my book. Some people want to stay in the fixed mindset, sort of like they want to stay in the matrix. Like, you know, there was a one guy in the matrix that went he got out of the matrix, but he wanted to be put back in the matrix because, you know, having to grow and deal with like the reality uh, was too much. He preferred the comfort of what he was used to. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and not everybody wants to, to shift into the growth mindset. So you, know, you have to make that a assessment as a leader. And then also what I did when I started hiring new people is I used to hire for technical skills first and then like people skills second. Mm -hmm. And that was a not a good process. So I flipped the script and looked at cultural fit, looked at growth mindset, look at core value fit, look at what they're passionate about and look at their people skills. And once they passed all that, then and only then would I look at their technical skills. I think that's interesting because it, it's almost um, like the reverse of what you would think it would be you know, for something as technical as cybersecurity, sure, you want someone who has the skills, but, and you, you mentioned it in the book, you can teach people that. Mm -hmm. It's the softer skills that are harder to, to get them to learn something because they don't always want to. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, I think it's important to remember, you know, that's, it's a great call out in the book. Um, when you're talking about education and, and ha you can always get another certification, you know, there's certifications left and right out there. And, and you talk about this, it's easy to get some of those certifications mm -hmm. um, that doesn't always make that person qualified to work for your company. And I, and I say that like that because you're the one as the leader and that executive who's setting the tone, you know, you're you have the vision. So you have to make sure that that person is someone who, yeah, has the technical skills, but can really live out the vision for what you are creating as the executive. And right. without those softer skills, that's really hard to do. Um, so I, I mean, those are things that I appreciate with, with the smartest person in the room and reading this. Tell us about writing it? What was the writing process like for you? Was it a challenge? Was it fun? <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, uh, it was a definitely a challenge. I started writing uh, in January of 2020. Uh, and, you know, I had a lot of uh, thoughts on things. So it took a, a while to sort of crystallize and organize the thoughts into like the seven step methodology, uh, you know, organize them properly. And 
then uh, doing the revisions took a long time as well. The revisions took, I think that my first draft was around 39,000 words. And after I did the revisions, it was up to like 65,000 words and I ended up around, around 59,000. So the revision, revisions took a lot more time than I expected. Um, it was important though. And I was traveling in like Dublin, I think for part of the revisions and in Portugal. So, uh, you know, I like, I spent like pretty much every weekend while I was in Portugal on, on pseudo vacation, uh, revising my book to keep the timeline. Uh, and uh, it was, it was uh, a little bit um, challenging because I, you know, I, I had to reflect a lot of, on my own life and see, I could see myself in scenarios where, uh, or past relationships where there were things that, that I did not do very well. And, you know, I, and I, and I have the awareness now, but it forced me to like look back on my life and look at scenarios where I was part of the problem or I was a reason something didn't go well. So it's a little bit um, uh, reflective from that perspective as well. How did that impact you? I mean, it's never easy to sit back and realize that you're how you impact the situation. So what was your mindset like going through it? How did, how was, how were those situations received for you? It was, uh, I mean, I cut a lot of stuff out of the book too. Uh, so some of the stuff I had in there was a little more personal, but it, I, I don't think it fit the context of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was very, um, you know, painful, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> to be honest. And some of it was like uh, painful. I was like, man, I, you know, in that scenario now, based on what I know now, I uh, I wasn't a good person in that scenario and I didn't handle it very well. And, uh, you know, I, I feel, I f would feel bad uh, about uh, the, the person I was dealing with in that scenario, because I, I realized based on the things I know now that, you know, I did not serve them. I didn't add value to the scenario. I, I didn't, you know, create a, a decent outcome uh, or have, or do, or, or carry my, whatever I was doing out with intention. So yeah, it was, uh, you know, I, I uh, it was very difficult actually. I, there's a, you know, a few moments where I, uh, I you know, I just kind of, curled up in a fetal position and cried for a while, <laughs> you know, it's like, man, this is like, a, this is a tough journey, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's necessary. It, so it sounds like it was a really cathartic process. Were you able to find forgiveness for yourself? Cause I think that's such, as someone who does, does personal development, who's interested in mindset, who's interested in doing this work on that journey, that part is, is critical. Like, to be able to sit back and go, I, I was awful at, at this point, mm -hmm. here's why, but not have to dwell on it so much that you can find that forgiveness for yourself. What was that like for you? I think uh, I, I was able to forgive myself. Uh, the, the saving grace or the way I look at it is, uh, I, I wanna be a better person tomorrow than I am today. Uh, so keeping that in mind, of, of course, you know, yesterday and the day before and last year, certainly there are things that I would have done based on my awareness now that, you know, I would disagree with at this point. Um, but if I didn't take the journey uh, to become better, I would still be repeating those same patterns uh, and, and, you know, hurting relationships, relationships or whatever. So I think having you know, the, the awareness that, you know, as long as I'm progressing, uh, then, you know, I can forgive whatever I did in the past uh, and accept, accept it. Uh, and that's becomes part of me. But then also, you know, the, the feeling guilty thing is probably the biggest challenge I think a lot of people have. And, and I have this challenge too, is I would feel guilty, like, about things that in the past, not so much, I would accept them, but I would still feel a little bit guilty. And that's something that you know, when you look at life uh, and experiences you've had in the past, uh, you know, we, we get to just decide what kind of meaning we attach to those experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I attach guilt to something in the past, for instance, and feel guilty about it, and, and if I just step back and disassociate, you know, how is that serving me today? If it's holding me back today, then maybe I should attach a different meaning to that experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something we, we all need to do because we have, you know, the power to decide uh, what something means to us. Uh, ultimately, ultimately, and they teach you this, and uh, I think the Landmark Forum is one of the courses I took, 
uh, ultimately that they teach you that, um, and I agree that there is no meaning to life. The only meaning is the meaning you attach to it. So if you had a bad childhood, you could attach a resentful attitude about it or a grateful attitude about it. You know, you, and you should attach one that serves you basically. Mm -hmm. It's about really knowing what feels right and good for you. And, and it's really, it's about being authentic and, and I think there's some power too in knowing that you can change it when it's not fitting mm -hmm. you anymore. Because I know for myself, like those old patterns, the way I was seeing my life ran the same way for a very long time. And then eventually I got to a point where I was like, wait a minute. And I kind of looked around and I'm like, something doesn't fit anymore. And that was me. <laughs> like I didn't fit because I was assigning the wrong labels. Mm -hmm. So at any given moment, you can change that concept and that vision or, or how you're identifying in your own life. You're not stuck there. Right. We have the ability to uh, shift our identity, uh, but our ego does everything it can do to protect our identity. And it's interesting. I was talking to someone uh, last week and they described themselves as an introvert for their entire life. So, you know, if they identified themselves as an introvert, their ego would do whatever it could do to protect that identity. But then something shifted in this person and they decided they to get where they wanted to go. They had to be an extrovert. Mm -hmm. So this guy just made the decision to go out there and be an extrovert. And since he decided his identity is now an extrovert, he would do things that were extrovert related. So it was just a a really decision is all it was for him. Yep. And at any given moment, we talk about this all the time here on the power to pivot at mm -hmm. any given moment, you can make that new choice and it puts you on a completely different path because you're right. Like the ego, it's, it's the part of the problem for us. It's the major problem because it wants to keep us safe right where we are comfy, cozy, even though we feel so uncomfortable, there's comfort in that discomfort. Um, mm -hmm. But and so we block, it's almost like we put blinders on to any other possibility. And then the moment you're like, wait, I'm done with this. This isn't working. Something's got to change. It's like, it's like the curtain drops and all these other possibilities unfold and you can pick which ones you want. Um, and then you can, you end up in a completely different place in life. Um, tell us, I love this word. I was so excited when I opened the book and I found that you talk about Kaizen in your book. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell us what Kaizen is. Kaizen is a Japanese word that essentially means constant and never ending improvement. Uh, it's, it's about finding the, the root cause for something and making improvements on it and then, and then revisiting that later on. A lot of us are afraid to start something because we wanna have it perfect before we start it. And Kaizen is like, let's just, you know, kind of embraces the philosophy of, of starting it and then getting some information as you go through the process or the journey and then tweaking it as you go along until you get it better and better and better. So with the, the seven steps in my methodology, uh, it's, it's a journey. It's not like one day you're going to read about mindset and become an expert in mindset. It's a practice and a journey. So with Kaizen, uh, we have to understand that it's, it's a journey and as long as we're making improvements, even if they're, you know, very small, that's ultimately what matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I talk about masters and, and dabblers a little bit in the book. Uh, somebody that wants to go towards mastery will practice Kaizen. And sometimes uh, when you're going from the beginning to that, that journey of, of mastery, you can have these valleys and these peaks, right? And the valleys are where you actually get worse before you get better. And that's because sometimes to get to the next level in something, you actually have to unlearn what you've learned. Uh, and that'll make you actually actually get temporarily worse at it. Um, but a lot of life is about unlearning things we've learned actually. So, and even like, even our beliefs, you know, lie is, is in the middle of belief, right? So <laughs> a lot of the things we believe later on, we realize that uh, we, we don't believe them anymore. So mm -hmm. that was actually a lie. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a journey really though. No, it's interesting because I always, um, it never ceases to amaze me because the things that we pull into our adult life, we, we learn from times when we're so little mm -hmm. and we have no context for the world when we're learning them. And 
then it's like we have to apply these situations that we somehow got context for when we were five or six years old and they're happening when we're like you know 35 or 40 and they don't fit they're not working um i love that you talk about kaizen you know and and this idea of it you know you're constantly working through it and and i'll point out too the work is never done you're always moving forward there's never an ending point to this in in growth personal development like there's never going to be this this point where you get and you're like okay i'm done <laughs> and you know it all <laughs> you know it, we'd like to think there is <laughs> but I mean, would you agree with that like what do you think I agree 100%. Uh, I mean, the, I guess the end of the journey is when you are no longer living, basically. <laughs> There's always something to learn, though. Yes, no matter how old you are, no matter where you are. Exactly. How did, I, I'm curious, is that that kind of philosophy, how you got into Ironman and mountain climbing, um, you know, where it's, you're not just improving yourself, like in terms of your career, or your um, mental development, like, when you're an Ironman athlete, like you, you're all in. So is that about continuously improving in the physical body too, and your, your health as well? With Ironman, it's uh, for me, it's about, it's about the challenge. It's a lot, a lot of it's mental. It's probably 50% mental uh, mm -hmm. and 50% physical, obviously, and some nutrition, but uh, it's really about the challenge and the journey working towards the Ironman and then during the race itself, uh, you know, during the race itself, it's like this, um, it usually takes me like 13 hours or so to finish an Ironman. Mm -hmm. So it's like this inner battle with yourself because at some point you feel horrible, at some point you feel okay, at some point you feel like stopping. So all these things go through your head and and it's about, you know, reconciling that while you're going through this, this, this race with other people around you. So it's like a journey with other people too. And everybody, everyone's really supportive, but Ultimately, I think why I like Ironman or mountaineering or, or survival training or whatever is because I feel like in order for me to be better equipped to deal with change or whatever's thrown at me, I, I need to have the ability to be more resourceful and more resilient. And when you put yourself through decent challenges like uh, you know, climbing a mountain or doing an Ironman, that journey forces you to overcome limitations that you had uh, prior to that journey and those limitations and then that ability to overcome them uh, is really what applies to other limitations you, you may encounter later on. Mm -hmm. I, how, what was the point where you're like, I'm going to do an Ironman? Like I, my son is huge into fitness and he's like, mom, I think we should do it. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I've climbed a mountain. So my first book talks about my experience climbing a mountain. I've, I have talked about this before here on the show. Like I, I think about that and, and I get it, but like what moment, where, where were you when you're like, I think I'm going to try this. <laughs> Hats off to you, by the way. <laughs> it's yeah, not for it, everybody. I, I, I mentioned the, the kind of the moment a little bit in the book, uh, a friend of mine who was like a super competitive, this is probably 15, 16 years ago, the most competitive person I know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, he one day said, hey, there's this triathlon. Do you want to do it with me? And I had no idea what a triathlon was. Uh, you know, I didn't know how to swim. I was more like a guy that just went to the gym and lifted weights. Uh, so I, I didn't know anything about endurance. I didn't have a bike. But I said yes, because I was that competitive with this guy and I wanted to like beat him. <laughs> so it was like about a month away. So I learned how to swim uh, because before that I could I could not even swim like the length of a pool, like one way. Uh, and I read this book, Total Immersion and figured out how to swim. I borrowed somebody's bike. I put these like clipless pedals in the bike and probably fell down like 15 times or something. But I, you know, I, also, I, I ran with like a cotton shirt and got like chafed. And I did all did everything you can do possibly wrong, uh, but I ended up beating my friend at that race. And then after that, I kind of got hooked. I was like, this is kind of cool because it gave me a reason to work out. And it wasn't just like lifting weights. It was like, I, I can always get better at swimming. I can get better at biking. I can get better at running. There's this challenge of doing all three. There's a challenge of learning what to eat. There's always something to learn. Uh, so then I thought, okay, what's the next like level up from the first race I did, which was like a, they call it Olympic distance, like a quarter Ironman. So I would just kind of keep up, up in the level. So it goes from quarter to like a half distance Ironman. And then after a half, there's like nothing between a half and a full distance. 
So I was like, okay, I guess I'll do the full. And um, I went and did the full in Louisville, Kentucky. That was my first one. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was very challenging, but it was also very, very rewarding. Because mm-hmm. uh, you know, to put yourself through something that you, you, you're not sure you can do and everyone else thinks you're crazy uh, and you finish it, uh, it, it, it makes you realize that you're capable more than you, more than you thought you were. You're, you were selling yourself short to begin with. Absolutely. And I think it's, we think it's hard. We tell ourselves we're afraid and it's going to hurt. That yeah. That's what I have learned um, from my own experience. Like it, it's about those, we, we just tell ourselves, this is too hard. I've done it to myself in the gym. I did it to myself, you know, climbing a mountain. You know, I've given myself every reason why I shouldn't be there and should have stayed in bed that day, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I, when's your next race are you because you're still racing right yeah i have iron man tulsa uh on may 23rd i think that's my next one it's about 62 days away uh last year i had three iron mans on my calendar and they all got canceled due to COVID 19. this one i'm not sure it'll get canceled or not but that's my next one i have three on the calendar this year um yeah iron man tulsa uh is the next one Okay, well, hopefully, you know, 2021 is uh, shaping up to be a better year. Um, So good luck with those. Any last minute thoughts that you want to leave with listeners before we go? I think since we're talking about the power to pivot and and making decisions on, on that, I think it's important to listen to your entire body when it comes to uh, being pulled towards something or being, uh, you know, pushed away from something, uh, we tend to like overanalyze things in our head and make decisions purely based on logic. Um, and I talk about this in the book with, with my decisions, the decisions I've made based on logic only have been like 80% wrong. So if you're faced with, uh, you know, decision, you need to look, look at your, listen to your, your body, which most people say is your gut, but it could be you know, your, our body has other things telling us signs, like if the hair stands up on your arm or do you have a chill down your spine, that's your body warning you of something. And then also like take some time and settle in and listen to what your heart is telling you as well. Uh, and then, you know, if, 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 you're, if your heart in your, in your body, your gut's telling you strongly that it's time to try something different, uh, then you should probably do that. You know, as much as we want to argue intellectually that, now is not the right time. This is blah, 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 blah. You know, if you feel, if you're in tune with your gut and your, in your heart and it tells you to do something, um, my recommendation is to, to listen to that. Mm-hmm. Love it. Absolutely agree. The book again is the smartest person in the room, the root cause, a new solution for cybersecurity. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Christian, I am so grateful that you were here today. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And as we end every episode, remember, guys, you are never stuck, you are never lost, and you are never alone at any given moment. You can use your power to pivot, which is to make a new choice and start again. And I'll see you guys on the next episode. Take care.